most recent Chanel price increase has sparked a lot of fury, a lot of frustration, a lot of discussion on YouTube and on Instagram, on purse blog forum posts, on TikTok, and it's been the same pretty much every year, every time they do an increase, except in the last couple of increases, the increases have been quite aggressive. And I refrained from commenting on the increase before it actually happened, simply because I wanted to know what is actually going to happen. Like, I can't stop it from happening. We know it's happening. It happens every year. And I wanted to assess the climate after the price increase and share my thoughts with you guys. I didn't watch a whole lot of videos online on this topic. I know there were a few and I still have to catch up with my YouTube watching. I mean, I watch stuff here and there when I have time, but there are a few of uh, the you know YouTubers that I follow and I, I'd love to know what they have to say, so I still have them on my wait list to watch. I did watch uh, Tiana Perry's video. I watched uh, Haya Glamazin's video and I watched uh, Lily Shop's video. And all of them had some great little points that I wanted to touch base on as well as comment on and then a few points of my own. I want to look at this at several different vantage points. Uh, some people have asked me if I will still buy Chanel. They even asked that before with the price increases. So I wanted to comment on that. So I have many thoughts written down and I don't want to miss anything so I have everything on my iPad. I just Anytime I think of an idea, I just write it down. So, you know, I'm, I'll, I'll be referring to this as I go along, so if you don't mind. And this will be quite a long video, I can see it already. And I enjoy these type of long videos, and I think some of you also do as well. When these long discussion videos are posted, I get really excited because that means I can just play it and then, you know, set it and forget it, and then just listen as I'm cleaning or cleaning out a closet. So if you've got laundry to do, if you have your closet to organize, if you're planning outfits, to go out because we're opening back up and you know dining is open and movie theaters are opening which is amazing uh, then you can go ahead and start planning what you're gonna wear because you know it's been a while uh, speaking of things opening back up I don't know about you I've just been so exhausted and you know I have been working throughout the pandemic uh, you know going into work and it's just I, I don't know I've, I've just been so exhausted I wanted to film this video and I just didn't have the energy to I have backlog footage of videos that I want to post but I just didn't have the time or energy to edit them so I'm I apologize for that the um, I think it's, you know what I think it is is our endurance to socialize has gone down we've become used to being little hermits in our house and not going out. I mean, before pre-pandemic, it was like after work, you know, you're just going to go straight from work, maybe change up a little bit, go to a restaurant or, you know, and it'll be like a Friday, Saturday and even Sunday thing and then back to work on Monday. And, you know, you're just go, go, go. And there were a lot of social events as well. And now it's like everything's kind of opening back up and, you know, like my weekends are now booked doing things, which I'm so grateful for. But at the same time, I'm just, I'm exhausted. And even if I talk to somebody on the phone, like I need a nap. <laughs> I don't know. I think the endurance, we need to slowly build back our endurance to socialize because we've been just so used to being at home and just, you know, being quiet and not having to reach out to anybody. And, you know, even going grocery shopping, like it's exhausting. So um, we need to work on our endurance a little bit more now. Uh, so yeah, go find yourself like a chore to do. I don't think I'm gonna do any sort of cutaways or showing things. If I do, then I'll, I'll let you know. But I mean, it wouldn't be anything important. So we're just gonna talk. So there was a lot of panic buying going on as you know, with any price increase, even last year. Um, the price increase this time around in Canada, I know in the US they were projecting about $1,000, which is about true. Um, price increase on classic bags such as the classic flap, the reissue 2.55, the Gabrielle, the uh, Chanel 19, uh, what other classic bags are there? Um, I'm missing one, the boy bag. These have all undergone a price increase and in Canada on classic flaps it's been about $800 Canadian on all around for all the sizes and you know I won't put up infographics on price increase because I know everybody's probably you know seen these already but I did do an Instagram post and I put um, you know Prime Minister Justin Trudeau very sad in the photo <laughs> of just the Chanel classic flaps and how much they've gone up and it's just like I don't know I've become kind of desensitized to these price increases because they always happen the first time I ever heard of a price increase concept for Chanel was 
way back, I mean, I was watching Makeup by Tiffany D. That's one of the first YouTubers I've ever watched on YouTube and I still, you know, have her, I've still subscribed. I still watch her videos from time to time. She does really nice chatty videos too, so. Um, and I remember she had bought a pre-loved uh, jumbo single flap handbag uh, on the secondhand market and she was talking about how the prices <clears throat> She was talking about how the prices increase every single year and people keep buying them and that's the problem. Like people keep buying them, the prices go up and it drives people to keep buying and buying and buying. And so I already, you know, got into the idea of how Chanel uses this as their marketing strategy. And a lot of people have been frustrated lately with the aggressive price increases because um, the, the really aggressive one was done last year in 2020, in my opinion, and I, I, as well as everybody in the community, still has PTSD from that because it was done at such a... It was, it was distasteful. It, it really was. And I know a lot of people were trying to justify it, and I was watching videos at the time of people justifying it. And even myself, I tried to justify it as well. But I still think it was distasteful, the degree and the the, the, the percentage of the increase. It was around 20, 15 to 20%, more closer to the 20% for Canada. And it was just done at such a distasteful time when everything's closed. We're in like a global pandemic. We're still quite scared because the pandemic was quite fresh. And you know, you're already quite triggered by everything that's happening around you. So when you have events that go on at the same time, they become quite memorable in psychology, like they're etched in your brain. And I know first world problems, I understand. Like, I mean, there's worse things that can happen and, and that's why it was like, okay, fine, it's a price increase. But still, like we still remember that and it was just like, okay, like everybody can't go into boutique and you know, we're in almost kind of like a financial crisis, everybody's quite sensitive and then now you've just jacked up the price on these items. It was, it was found to be distasteful and it wasn't just Chanel that did that. I mean, Dior did that as well. Other houses have done that as well, but more of the focus has been on Chanel. And you know, what I'm gonna say in this video is, yeah, these are just my opinions and I'd love to know what your thoughts are below. Um, with the pandemic, what I've realized is that your friends and your family and your health is the most important thing. As soon as that happened, as soon as we were seeing people dying in other countries from this, um, I came to the realization like, holy shit, like I've, I have so many beautiful things and what if I die and I don't enjoy them? Like what if I, you know, I, I get sick or what if, you know, my life ends because of this and I've kept all of these bags in pristine condition and you know you know kind of like you know like treating them like little babies and not using them and, and feeling and, and, and enjoying them and then if your life ends like there you go you can't take anything with you so my perspective changed a little bit then as well and that it's not really worth stressing over luxury because there's just more important things in the world and luxury is meant to be enjoyed and you know and, and it should be fun right so we still have ptsd from the 2020 increase that was still a fresh like it's still fresh in our minds and all of a sudden another increase now i know the us had two little increases i wouldn't call them little they were still substantial but two increases in between because what Chanel has done since I think 2015 is they've harmonized their prices globally and you know and that that's the reason why certain countries will have an increase versus other countries and the increase might be different because they're trying to keep a level playing field globally so that everybody pays pretty much the same tax included tax not included uh, so you know if I travel to say Paris and I buy a Chanel handbag uh, Yes, you'll get the VAT refund, but then by the time you come back and you pay your tax on it, it's about the same. You might save maybe a hundred, two hundred dollars. It depends on how the currencies are, but generally speaking, it is about the same. Uh, but there are periods of time where you know it might be cheaper in a country before they've even done an increase. So prior to the last, the recent increase in the U.S., um, Chanel was still cheaper for Canadians to buy 
uh, in the US versus in Canada just because it uh, depends on the state, depends on the tax, and also the price was a bit lower. And now, with the increase that the US had in comparison to Canada, it's actually a little bit more expensive, if not the same, as purchasing in Canada. So they've always done this harmonization globally, and I remember even traveling, uh, excited to, you know, maybe get a handbag in France and knowing that there is an increase coming up. I remember one time we were visiting uh, Nice, Cannes, and uh, Monaco. Uh, and we drove a bit around as well. And I remember, oh, there's going to be a price increase. It was, I think, like end of May. And I actually was like, you know what? I'm gonna go before the price increase. And I remember I got there and Chanel had increased the price a couple of days before the rumored increase date. And this time around, it was July 1st and it did actually happen on July 1st. Happy Canada Day, folks. Um, it, it actually happened. So I was thinking, wait, maybe Chanel might just kind of be, you know, a little bit sneaky and just increase like a couple of days before, but they didn't do that. But the increases then were, you know, maybe like $200, $300, still a lot compared to other brands, but still a lot. But they've just been more and more aggressive lately where you're getting into like $1,000 or $800, which is a lot for a handbag to increase every single year. And they've been more frequent and more aggressive lately and Chanel knows that they can get away with it. A lot of people are frustrated and I would be too if I was in that, if, if I was in your shoes and I was saving up for my first bag or I'm you know, starting my collection, I wanna treat myself to something luxurious and they keep increasing these prices so aggressively. I would also be frustrated and I would also feel priced out and I would also feel as though Chanel doesn't want my business and, and people have said, well, Market's oversaturated. They don't want, you know, ordinary people to buy their handbags or their products. They just want the richest of the rich to buy their products. I don't think that is true. Uh, I, it may seem like it, but I don't think it is true because that is their marketing strategy. As Makeup by Tiffany D way back, like I think 10 years ago, she had said that is their marketing strategy and it keeps people wanting more and it works on us. I mean, even me, okay? like. During the pandemic, I actually bought more after that massive price increase than I ever have. I mean, usually like I'll buy maybe one or two items a year at max. And this time around, it's it's like, okay, like we didn't have anywhere to go. Okay, arguably, okay, we didn't, we, we, you know, if you are working, if you're lucky enough to be working or you're lucky enough to be earning during this pandemic, because there are a lot of people that lost a lot of business and a lot of income because and suffered financially, but there are a lot of people that were still working and were caring about their normal life and had income to support this and they could instead because they're not you know going out and you know going to restaurants they're not you know partaking in any sort of entertainment which costs money they're not going on vacation they're not hosting events um, people were focusing on either renovating their homes uh, you know or adding comforts to their home and also buying luxury in a way to sort of give you some sort of uh, satisfaction or you know maybe you you had like a budget for the year but you're like you know what I'm not going to be spending on that stuff now I have this extra these extra funds that I can put towards my dream luxury purchases which is great but it but it worked like it really worked that huge price increase last year worked people were buying more and more and you had the resellers on the scene which they were there before but it it created more FOMO Okay, so more FOMO because the price is going to go up and that's the marketing strategy, right? Everybody is on like a constant, like, you know, like I feel like you're like a little mouse on the little, you know, what is it called? That little wheel in the cage, right? Like, or you're walking on eggshells because you're like, buy now. And you see YouTubers say like the time to buy is now or yesterday. And it's just like real estate right now, right? Like the price is just insane. And they're saying, well, you know, you buy now because the price is just going to go up or the value is going to go up and you know that's flawed in so many ways and that's how Chanel keeps that dream of owning a Chanel handbag fresh in our minds because these handbags like if they were still the same price they were 10 years ago they may not be as uh, exclusive or they may not be as desirable so they have to keep increasing the price to increase desirability so that 
everybody would want to buy it, not just the richest of the rich, and people will just save more. Our barometer for these prices has been conditioned according to the price increases. Now, I, my barometer or my benchmark for Chanel handbags is at about five, six thousand dollars, right? Because that's you know when you know I was buying more of those classic flaps. And to be honest, when I see a classic flap and I hold it in my hands, and not just the current price tag right now, like then, I mean, a medium classic flap with tax is about ten thousand dollars. Now it'll be, I think, it's close to eleven. It didn't feel like a ten thousand dollar handbag because my barometer is still stuck at five six k. Think about the people that bought that same bag several years ago at fifteen hundred dollars or like a thousand dollars. Their barometer still set there, and you know they're probably flabbergasted and just laughing because these bags are so ridiculously expensive in comparison to then. And I I, I remember I shared that story with you where I was. Last year I was waiting outside the Chanel boutique and there was this older woman standing there and she had a beautiful yellow lambskin classic flap and I complimented her on it and it looked like it was used, it had marks on it, like, you know, she was beating it up and really enjoying this bag. And, and she's like, you know, I don't want to go in there because it's scary, like, have you seen the prices? And I just kind of like laughed and, and she's like, it's not funny. And I'm like, ha ha ha. And she looked at me seriously, she's like, tapped me on the shoulder, she's like, it's not funny. And I was like, yeah, it's not funny because people like her, like, you know, bought these things years ago and they think like, okay, well, what the hell is going on, right? Like, why are these girls like, or men, right? Like, you know, anybody who's new to it and still like, yes, 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 take my money. Just take my money. 10K for a medium classic flap, just take it. They think it's ridiculous, right? Like, because they're just like, what are you people doing? Like, you're just fueling this greed that Chanel has and I remember people were justifying the massive price increase last year and saying well um, and I've even I even chimed in look I even said this because I, I heard it and I'm like okay makes sense um, supply chain cost of raw materials which we know yes ha ha absolutely have gone up of course like, I mean wood has gone up okay groceries have gone up so the whole supply chain was messed up by this pandemic and hence the you know prices have gone up for raw materials. Um, Chanel was also retaining all of their employees in the boutiques. They didn't lay anybody off, so they wanted to make sure that they were, you know, paying their employees and making sure that they're employed despite being closed. The thing is is that they still did business while they were closed. First of all, I mean, we can all agree with luxury handbags. Doesn't matter if it's Chanel. It doesn't mean matter if it's Hermes. Doesn't mean matter if it's Dior or Fendi or you know or LV or you know. It doesn't matter. We know that the price that they're sold for does definitely is way overpriced compared to the cost of producing that item and and we know that because it's business they have to make money okay they're putting that money in marketing um they have other investments they have other companies and it's not just you know selling an item and making a profit and then giving that profit to employees and a little bit of advertising they're doing a lot of things behind closed doors that they're investing in and we're investing into the brand we all know that we all understand that people have said that before so okay so they retained their employees, but they were still open during, I mean, they were closed, but they were still selling during the pandemic. And in fact, I think even more than before. Haya Glamazin did a video and I watched her video and I love watching her videos as well. She does great discussions and she was, she reads like financial reports, okay? And she was saying like, Chanel did really well for 2020. Like, People think Hermes did really, really well for 2020. Like, I think it was like 6.5, I think I've written down, 6.3 or 6.5 billion euros that they did. Chanel did like 10? Yeah, so 6.3 billion euro, 2020, Hermes. Chanel did 10 billion euros in 2020. Now, apparently that's still 18% less than the year before, but they still did really, really well, okay? So, the, there's profit. There's still profit, and and they got away with it. That tw that 15 to 20 percent increase. They saw. Okay, this is the largest we've ever done. People are still buying. So if you were a business, and you saw that you just had this huge increase, and people are still buying, you would still you would also increase the price because you're making more profit. 
and they know they're getting away with it. People like me, people like you all that are watching, we fuel this, like it's, we drive this increase, okay? Chanel can get away with it and we're running like like little mice on little wheels, like wanting to pay more. And, um, and they know that they can get away with it. Social media for Chanel has been growing so much. I mean, before, you know, Chanel has been, we think it's oversaturated. So now here's the thing, we think that Chanel is oversaturated and I have to disagree because remember I did that video on basic luxury uh, and critiquing that whole argument of people saying that certain luxury items are basic and how I completely think that is completely wrong, okay? Um, because we we actively search for that content, right? And that content, based on YouTube and Instagram and TikTok algorithms, that once we express interest in something, it finds us, okay? So we end up watching, you know, uh, you know, topics. Uh, we end up watching content or seeing content that is, you know, focused on, you know, Chanel. If you're into Hermes, you're gonna have more, you know, suggested videos on your For You page on, you know, TikTok and on YouTube on Hermes. So it's not that you are seeing it everywhere, it's because we're attracting it and, and, and we're actively searching for it. And when I walk around, maybe there's like a, maybe one or two spots in Toronto where I'll see, um, like, like if I walk around in Yorkville, okay, like which is a very upscale area of Toronto, um, you'll see a lot of Chanel bags and you'll see a lot of Hermes bags. And I can tell you, anytime I walk around in Yorkville, I will see like four or five Hermes Birkins and Kelly's around, okay? And I'll see Chanel handbags of varying styles. Like, it's not, like, you you see it. It's, But that's where I can see it's saturated, so-called saturated. But everywhere else, when I walk around in Toronto in the city, if I walk anywhere, if I'm anywhere else, I don't see people carrying or wearing luxury brands. Okay, so it's not oversaturated. There's a very small percentage of the world that buys these items. It's not normal to pay that much for a handbag. We normalize it because uh, we, we become desensitized to these prices because we're like, okay, like our barometer was at, you know, now it's set at like 10K. When we see a bag that's 7K, we're like, oh, that's a steal, which is flawed because obviously it's not. It's $7,000 for a bag. But, you know, we start to think of like, oh, well, that was Chanel bag. You're getting it for $4,500? Wow, that's a steal. So our barometer has changed. So bags are never worth the price that they're sold at. We know that. And you are paying for the experience of buying the bag. Some people can argue that the experience has been terrible, especially during the pandemic. And you know, I can, I can, you know, sympathize for that. But it's the experience or the act of buying that saying, oh, I own a Chanel bag. Like that, that's what you're paying for, that prestige in a handbag or an Hermes bag or a Dior bag. You're paying for that prestige and that experience of having something authentic from that house. You're buying a piece of the brand. And they make a lot of money from people like you and me who buy their handbags and small leather goods. Um, I remember Jerusha Couture uh, last year did a video saying Chanel doesn't care about us buying the bags. Their creme de la creme clientele is a very small percentage of the world who buys like their entire like I don't know spring summer 2021 line of ready to wear um, you know their high fashion jewelry like not fashion their high fine jewelry like I'm talking like diamonds and stuff that you don't ever see in boutiques they're buying that sort of thing um, but I would say actually no like yes they're making probably a lot of profit and those items are very high ticket items but they're a very, very, very small percentage, okay? There is a very, very small percentage of people buying haute couture and, you know, they're not making a lot of money, in my opinion, on that. They're actually probably making a lot of money on handbags and, and things like that for everybody because it's just the FOMO and the social media and everybody just buying, buying, buying. Uh, that's, that's, I think, where they're making a lot of that, you know, 10 billion euro. So a lot of people have argued, well, I might as well buy Hermes. So uh, Tiana Perry is a lovely YouTuber who I also follow. She has great um, videos and she has a very um, strong collection of Hermes handbags and she's very knowledgeable on the brand and that's her thing. Like she's an Hermes girl, okay? And she had mentioned like, you know, I, I, this price increase has really put me off. The quality is terrible and I might as well buy 
um, you know, um, as bags because they're handmade and the quality is impeccable. So, you know, what she what she says, yes, in a way, it's true um, from her from her standpoint that you know there's better quality in Hermes and you know you're uh, you might as well put that money if you're going to spend 10k or 11k on a Chanel handbag you might as well buy an Hermes handbag and the prices are just so close now that people are comparing the two houses and I don't think that they can be compared they're completely different their marketing strategy is completely different um, their selection of items is completely different so you know with Chanel they're mostly um, known for like they're ready to wear their well before I mean before the handbags became so popular they were more known for their fashion jewelry they're ready to wear hats okay that's what they kind of started off with and, and then fragrance and the handbags came after and Hermes has a lot of a lot of items from you know a, a very broad price category so you can get things for like 200 bucks to uh, God knows how much right so very different houses. I would never compare the two because they're very they have very different products. And Hermes are mo more you know in terms of handbags, everybody focuses on the Birkin or the Kelly. They have other handbags, but nobody really. I mean, I guess if they're not as exclusive, there's not going to be as much drive. But here's the thing: like people saying that they might as well buy Hermes, you can't. Okay, like it's it's hard. Like you can't you can't just take that chunk of money. Well, okay, I'm gonna go buy a classic flap. Mm, never mind, that's eleven thousand. Uh, I'm gonna take this chunk of money. I'm just gonna go over to Hermes and buy a, a Birkin or a Kelly. You can't do that. So that argument, I, I find that a lot of people are making. I like that's a little bit flawed because you can't just go over to Hermes and buy a Birkin or a Kelly. Like maybe a handful of people have been able to walk in and just get one, but majority of the time there is you know like a, I guess like a, we call it like a game to play but you know y you have to be invested in the house and buy a lot of different other items before you were offered these bags so it's not I mean it might end, end up being more expensive for you in the long run right if you are gonna go and and try to score an Hermes Birkin or Kelly unless you go to Paris and you go to the flagship and that too if you get an appointment because it's a very high demand right now so I don't even think that's easy anymore so you can't just go and buy the handbag and yes you can understand like I mean they are they're, they're handmade um, as you know so we're told okay so with Hermes we don't really know exactly what their prices are and, and we can't really track price increases for their quota bags at least so no you can't take that money and, and simply just go to Hermes and get a handbag now Amaya Lux is another youtuber that I follow and this is way before the increase she was talking about um, that Hermes was opening more factories in France and that this could mean that they could increase production uh, for handbags and because you know there's a lot of resellers that are profiting off of these handbags and so they might as well just give the handbags to people who want them uh, and, and she was saying something like that I mean I, you, go watch her videos on this and that there, there might be um, more production for these handbags. So when Tiana said that she might as well buy Hermes for her because she does buy, like I mean, you know, she is a client there, so she can get those handbags. But for somebody who has just is just starting, they can't just do that. And so one thing is I wouldn't I wouldn't pit the two to, you know against each other because you can't compare them. The aesthetic is completely different. Um, the feeling that you get from both uh, houses is different. Yes, there have been some blunders with Chanel in terms of their handbags. They're not perfect. Um, I have come across some where I'm just like oh, I don't know, like they shouldn't have made it to the floor. But I mean. I can't say that Emma's quality is pristine or perfect either because I haven't seen everything. So I can't compare the two. Um, there's been like this whole argument of, you know, these bags are handmade, especially for Chanel. Like some sales associates will say that the bags are handmade. Um, and I don't know. I mean, like, like, I know they're obviously not handmade. And Emma, as everybody, you know, really, really says, like, oh, these are all handmade. Uh, but the thing is, is okay, so what is your definition of handmade? Like, are they hand stitched, like from start to finish, like cut, stitched? Like, that's what I define as like handmade. Um, if you're using like machines, like obviously you're gonna use a sewing machine, like that's not entirely handmade, you're using a machine. That's what I just think. But it depends, like, to, to what degree are these bags handmade. Um, with Hermes, they're entirely made in France, yes, we know that, in Chanel. 
I know Lily Shops had said, uh, because she works in the industry, and she had said, well, things can be marked that they're made in France or made in Italy or made in Spain, but you know, if you finish the bag in that country, you can put that label on there. But their starting point or their you know, initial stages of assembly can happen overseas in another country. And then when they come to the country where that stamp is going to be there, they might add like a button or something or a clasp and then they can put the, hey, it was made here. So your bag could potentially be made in like Indonesia, in China, in Singapore, in, in different other countries um, from the very beginning stages and then shipped to France or shipped to Italy or Spain and then have that stamp put in. So I'm not familiar with that but I can believe that that does happen because she had said they are made in factories and that they do lease uh, certain factories for a set amount of time where other bags are also made and they'll make they'll have like a run of production for a certain line for a temporary period and then they'll move on to making something else for another brand and they ship those items to the country that's what you know she had said and that's interesting and saying that Chanel might be restricting supply on some of these items because they can make they can make more bags but they choose not to and i'm not sure i did i do remember my sales associate saying that um they are going to be restricting classic flaps and they alluded to that where not only are they going to um, introduce like quotas that you can only purchase a certain number of bags per month or a certain number of classics per year um, which is realistic because what normal person is buying like two three bags every month right um, you know your regular customer is going to probably buy one bag a year or two bags a year so it doesn't really affect them but it was in a way to curb the resellers and that you know even for classics that they're going to get less and less so if you look at the chanel classic flap in beige claire uh you know gold hardware or silver hardware that boutiques and and they were saying that boutiques will only get like one every like two months like they, they can't order even if they wanted to they can't order more so i don't know if that's true for canada but that there are some restrictions in place for the classic flaps in the classic colors such as beige clair and black so you know and some people have said that yes it was hard to find uh especially last price increase a lot of people were trying to find the beige clair and the black classic flap and uh tati in the city uh on instagram uh you know it was really funny she was posting this in her stories that people are asking for bags and all of a sudden they're sold out you know right before the increase because there's all this panic buying but in reality those bags are being hidden uh until the price increase goes live and, and then the sales associates can be like oh we just we just got these bags in right and so they can sell them at a higher price and maybe boutiques do that i don't know um but when i was there about a week before the price increase they did have quite a number of classic flaps but um apparently you know all of a sudden they go missing and or they're sold out and then they're brought back out to be sold again right so at a higher price so going back to what lily shop said is that technically chanel can produce a lot more bags but they choose not to because they're restricting supply uh that may be true i don't know i'm not in that world that's not my industry so i don't know but uh, whereas Hermes, because they're entirely handmade uh, start to finish and it takes, I don't know how many hours to make one bag that, you know, they have to train all these artisans to make these bags and that's their limiting factor as to why they can't produce as many. And that scarcity is what drives that demand to buy these bags and because the demand is so high, the, the product, the supply is low and that inflates prices on the secondhand market to nearly double of what you would pay in boutique. So every business has to manage that delicate balance, their ratio of supply and, and demand and then prices and every business is different. So Chanel's marketing strategy, I don't think is to restrict handbags because there's plenty and there are plenty of designs. There's like six seasons a year, first of all, and you, know, you can't even keep up and they they have so many styles like not just classics they have beautiful seasonal bags as well that come out in different colors so i don't think it's about restricting supply there's always going to be something available for anyone who comes in with money to buy it but their marketing strategy has always been as makeup by tiffany d had said is increasing prices and that drives the fomo and people 
buying these, they just keep buying because they're afraid that they're going to go up in price. Whereas Hermes, you have the scarcity and because you can't easily get them, that also you know, increases the exclusivity and the allure that this is a hard to get item and it's only given to you know clients who are so-called worthy of the bag. Um, and that makes it more exclusive and it gives people that feeling that you know they're on another level, really, right? It makes you feel like you're on another level when you have this handbag. So that's an entirely different marketing scheme. Chanel is a different marketing scheme. Both can be flawed in their own ways, but I don't think they're trying to be like each other. I don't think Chanel is trying to be like Hermes, as people are saying, because they're they're already doing better than Hermes. They did 10 billion versus Hermes doing 6.3 billion euros during a pandemic when everything is, you know, rock bottom. They did really, really well. Uh, now with FOMO, I did a video before and there's been a lot of discussion online about resellers and there's a lot of you know, frustration, not just resellers for Chanel, but resellers for Hermes as well. As we know, you buy a bag, you can immediately turn a profit and sell it for double because there's people who are, wait, are willing to pay that amount. They have the money, they just don't want to wait. Time is precious. They don't, they don't want to waste their time, but they have a lot of money to pay. Um, so for you know Chanel, you have resellers as well that I feel, I mean, maybe I wasn't following this before, but I feel, especially during the pandemic, did really well because stores were closed and people couldn't go you know, to different stores internationally, of course, they couldn't travel, and they were trying to buy the bag for the next IT release, the, the FOMO created by Instagram, by all the imagery, um, and also price increases. And so they really, you know, took off with that. There's been a lot of resellers and, you know, sometimes I think about it, like if Chanel really wanted to stop these resellers, um, they could. And Hermes could as well. They could definitely stop these resellers. Because with Hermes, like you think about it, like people want to buy the bag from the boutique because otherwise they'll have to go to the resale market and spend double or, you know, a, a pretty hefty markup and they want that experience of buying in the boutique. So. It just creates more drive into boutiques to buy some other other things so that they can get the bag directly from the boutique instead of from a reseller. And that's for your like average population, like you know, you and I, not like the elite of the elite or celebrities that have ample money and don't care and will buy from uh, you know a second a secondhand source. But the thing is with Chanel, I mean maybe maybe they're embracing the FOMO created by resellers like maybe they're embracing that because like hey listen like people there's already demand the resellers are creating a lot of hype that's great you know we're getting this ammo we're getting this you know the ball rolling people are wanting to come into boutique and buy and get on lists and get you know just just buy period the newest collections the newest it bags even if they don't want them because there's this FOMO created by resellers so maybe Maybe that's adding to the advantage. Maybe Chanel is getting good business because of this. Like, you know, it makes it makes you think because, like, they could definitely, you know, really stomp down on resellers. Uh, and I think they have tried, but I mean, they they can really be a lot more aggressive. Is is what I'm trying to say. So maybe they're trying to get take the advantage that it's giving. Even Lily Shops, what she had said is, yeah, like we, we need time for our brains to process these increases. And like I said, our barometers or our, um, you know, benchmark for these bags, you know, it settles and then you get used to it and then you have a new increase and you get used to that. We're still not, I'm still not used to the increase last year. I'll be honest with you. Again, when I hold the classic flap, it doesn't feel like $10,000 to me. It really doesn't. It feels like $5,000 or $6,000 to me. It doesn't feel like $10,000 to me because my brain has not had time to process that increase that this is now this price. And here's the whole investment argument as well, right? That also creates this drive for these handbags, especially for Chanel. Yes, the price increases have been aggressive and they've been steadily increasing, even surpassing inflation. Uh, the increases, as I've mentioned before, are in order to harmonize prices globally. Uh, I did a video actually critiquing this because people say these bags increase in value, right? And, and value means different things to different people. We don't know what value is. We know what absolute the, like the absolute value, which is the dollar amount, we know what that is, but the value of that dollar, we don't know what it is over time. 
uh, and values determined by many things. I don't work in finance, I don't work in economics or anything like that, that's not my field. So if any of you are, you know, experts in this, I would love to hear your opinions on this. Um, I did a video last year where I tried to measure the value of Chanel bags over time in terms of gold. Gold being the universal currency. So the argument is, well, you know, if you take $100,000 of cash, okay, and you just have it sitting in the bank account or wherever, okay, that $100,000 is not going to be worth the same or be able to buy the same. The buying power of that $100,000 is not going to be the same in a year or two years time. So that's why people invest to maintain or grow the value of that currency. So I was speaking to somebody, you know, this is pre-pandemic, we were talking about like real estate and all that and you know, that value you should measure in terms of gold because gold is a finite source, it's a universal currency and uh, in general, gold increases over time, okay? I'm brown, we, you know, our parents have always said gold is the best investment, even gold jewelry, but I'll argue even with jewelry too because, you know, unless you're, like, I mean, designer jewelry out of the question, okay, if you're going to Van Cleef and buying the guilloche, um bracelets, which are gold, we know very well that's 18 karat gold, it's not worth the price tag because you're paying for the name. I'm talking about buying jewelry from, you know, your, your local family jewelers, but still, you know, yes, you'll pay for the labor for that jewelry, okay, so you're not going to make that back, but the actual gold you can sell and buy more jewelry and as the value goes up over time of gold. And there is a steady increase. There's a site actually, I think it's called Gold Broker or something like that, or goldprice.org. I put in that last video I did so you can check it out. So you can look at the gold price every single day in a variety of different currencies over the last like 50 years or something. It's, it's insane, okay? You can, you can pull that information up. So the analysis is, okay, let's say I buy <clears throat> a handbag for $5,000 in 2015. I'm just pulling numbers out of my head. You look at the gold price of that day that you purchased that handbag and you convert and you say, okay, well, I spent 5K on a handbag. How much gold could I have bought? Okay, so maybe you can buy like three ounces of gold or four ounces of gold for that price. And if you really want to see if the value has gone up of that handbag that you purchased, give it a couple of years, okay? And then do the same analysis again. Okay, so what's the current price of this bag? So if the bag has increased from 5K to 10K, uh, how much gold can I buy with $10,000 today? And if the amount of gold has increased, that means that you have increased in value because you were able to buy more gold. If it has gone down, then technically the value has gone down. It's just your the, the currency or the dollar amount has gone up, but your buying power of that currency has changed okay so I did that whole video it was kind of long but if you like math I have some nice charts in there and I looked actually at some of my classic bags and in fact I lost on the amount of gold that I could purchase so I was like hey you know just so you know the value hasn't really gone up and the whole you know allure of being able to sell a Chanel handbag if you choose wisely classic flaps definitely like if I bought a bag for like five thousand dollars and I could sell it, I could turn a profit. I can't sell it at the current retail price, obviously, and I know some people say that, which is like a little bit flawed, because anyone who's gonna purchase on the secondhand market is not gonna pay retail, unless it's like a hot unicorn item, and in some cases they pay above retail for like a hot seasonal color that you can't find. That's rare, but in general, you're, you can't sell for the retail price, but you can still turn a profit. Like you can probably make like two or three K on it, but then you also have to think about, okay, that two or three K I made, is, is the buying power the same as the amount of money that I spent back in, you know, five years ago, okay? So, yes, in the short term, you can turn a profit on uh, a handbag that is hard to find. So, you know, let's say if I buy something and I, you know, have it sitting on the shelf, which a lot of people do. I have a lot of people that I see on Instagram who have personal collections and then they don't use them. It's sitting on the shelf and then they sell them. They turn them over to buy something new and that's their thing. Uh, and they can turn a profit because there is a demand for that item. But in the long run, also, you can perhaps turn a profit. But again, you have to assess if it's actually an increase in value or if you're just getting more you know, money, you might as well have invested that money 
in something else versus a handbag. So handbags, we all know, are not investments. They're not financial investments at all. Um, but in, in a way, you're not really throwing your money down the drain, okay? So if you do buy a Chanel Classic Flap, let's say if you do sell it, you might make the same amount of money, you might lose a little bit of money, you could make more money, but you're not gonna like sell it for like 500 bucks, okay? Like there are certain bags that you know you buy it and you know that you're not gonna get anything for it if you did sell it. So in that case, you know, it's a smart buy, but I wouldn't say it's an investment because for me at least, I mean, I, I'm not selling. Like, uh, if I'm, like, and my husband says this too, he's like, are you really gonna sell your bags? And it's true because I, I love all of the things that I have. And if anything, these price increases make me want to hoard them even more. There was a point where I was thinking of selling my Chanel boy bag, which is a new medium size, and it's in lambskin with gold hardware. And I lusted after that bag. I was searching high and low for that combination I wanted actually a smooth calfskin, but anyway, I wanted a smooth leather. Um, and I finally found it, but then I never used it because I was too scared. It was it was at a point in my life where I was in school, so I wasn't carrying luxury to school. Um, and I never used it, and then I moved to other things. But I still love that bag. So, you know, if I was to sell it, I don't even want to sell it now because the price has gone up so much that if I ever wanted to add it back into my collection, I won't get a bag at that price as I did then, so I might as well just keep it. So I don't even want to sell now because it's just, if I wanted to replace it, it'll just be more expensive. So for me, they're not investments. It feels good to have these bags in my collection because I know that they are of good value, but they're not, um, they're not investments that I'm going to make money on. And we know that for a fact you could build wealth in so many other ways, so don't let anybody tell you that these are investments because they really aren't go watch that gold video that i talked about and if anybody you know wants to chime in on their views on this please let me know because i'm not an expert in this field but this made sense to me okay so i mean i could have I, if i wanted it as an investment it's gold but you can't really wear gold like unless you buy gold jewelry but then again gold jewelry you're losing on the labor to make that jewelry okay just so you know um Unless you know, you, unless you buy like gold coins or bars from the bank and you keep it in like a safe deposit box or something like that, and that you can't enjoy and wear, right? So what's the point? <laughs> so the bags I enjoy, I wear, and I use them. And, and like I said before the pandemic, I was keeping things so pristine, and I was so worried about them getting scratched or you know getting nicked or anything like that. And I realized I'm like I'm not. What's the point of buying luxury if you're not gonna enjoy it and use it? So. I've, you know, really, you know, because I, in my mind, I'm thinking, well, what if I want to sell them one day? I was thinking that and, you know, I would keep, I, like, I still do this. I keep the box. I keep everything. Just, I mean, I, I haven't, like, I mean, I, I'm, I don't have space, but I still keep everything and the bags. But why? Like, I'm not selling them. But in, before I was thinking, well, if I ever decide to sell them, then I have everything. But really, am I really selling them? There's, there's no point. Like, so that's why I was keeping them so pristine. What's the point? So now I'm really using the bags and I'm enjoying them. Like, I just love, that's the whole feeling of luxury, right? When you, like my, that tote bag right there, I really enjoy using, I was saving it for travel, okay? And I was using like a reusable tote to put my stuff in. And I'm like, there's something wrong here. Why do I have this laying around? And I really enjoy using that. I really do. It makes me happy when I put my, like, just the, the quality is there. I mean, people who say that Chanel quality is terrible, no, it, it, it's good quality. Their, their stuff is good quality. You might come across some stuff that's not, but in general, it's better than a lot of other brands out there, okay? So the quality is amazing, and I really do enjoy it, um, and it makes me happy. With my green trendy CC, I see that bag and I feel it and I, the lambskin, oh my gosh, I used to be afraid of lambskin because I was like, I'm going to scratch it and then I can't sell it. <laughs> That's so flawed. I love the feel of lambskin and it makes me so happy seeing that color, okay? Buying a color that's not a, like a, 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 you know, not buying it in black, okay? I was thinking of buying it in black. I still want it in black, but I mean... I always wanted it in black because it's a safe color to get and you know if I ever wanted to resell it people will buy it. 
No, I mean, I enjoy the green. It's such a beautiful, rich Kelly green. You can't even capture it on camera. And when I see it, I'm so it makes me so happy. And I enjoy it, and I get so many compliments on it. And other bags as well. Like, I don't care. Like, I just, I love feeling them. I'm still careful with them. I still keep things quite nice because I want my stuff to look nice over time. But I'm doing it for me, you know, instead of saving it to sell later, okay? So me as a buyer, that's not me. I buy things. I, I'm, I, I scrutinize things when I buy them. I, I don't buy stuff that I semi-like. I buy things that I love and I don't have any intention to sell them yet. Maybe in the future, like, I mean, because right now my collection is a bit ridiculous and there's a lot. I don't want to sell anything yet, but there might be a point where I'm like, okay, you know what, you're running out of space and there are clearly things that you're not wearing or using, so you might need to let them go because it's wasteful. But so far, I don't have any intention to sell, so they're not an investment for me. So like that whole like social media training you to think that these are investments that you need to care for them. Like God's sake, like I was leaving stickers on the hardware. Why? So I took all my stickers off. Like all of my bags, I pretty much everything I think I, I took all the stickers off because I'm like, why am I protecting the hardware? I want to enjoy the hardware, right? Like it's shiny, it's beautiful. What am I doing? So I took off all the stickers, I'm using the bags, and that's how it should be. That's that's that you know, I'm not talking, this isn't monetary investment, this is investment in to your, I guess, happiness or your enjoyment of using the luxury, okay? In that case, okay, maybe call it investment. But yeah, unless you're turning things over immediately, like hot items or, you know, you're, that's how you can make a profit. Um, on the secondhand market, I know preload prices have been going up as well. There was an article on Perspop um, about how prices appear to be going up on major sites like the Real Real Fashion File, where even prior to an increase, certain bags will be taken down and then the price will go up in relation to the increase. And you know, people will still buy them because they're still going to get a bit of a, a bargain. But for, if you're using consignment such as that, just know that you as the seller are probably not going to make the same because they're going to give you a terrible buyout price and then they're going to sell it for the profit. So they're the ones who are making the profit and, and rightfully so because they're dealing with the whole headache of shipping and you know satisfying the customer and you can just sell it to them and just be done with it. Um, so there's a whole headache with selling as well. And if I was a buyer, and I'm buying something on the pre-love market, then it has to be a like it has to be a significant discount. Otherwise, I'd might as well just buy in boutique. Like let's say if there's a classic flop and it's you know 10k or 11k right now, and I can get a the same classic flop on the secondhand market for maybe nine thousand or eight thousand. And in my head, I'm thinking. I'm already there, you know, maybe when the bags were like a lot less, like 6,000, 5,000, that would be like a bargain. But now because they're already so up there, I'm thinking, well, I'm already there. Like I'm already like 80% there. Why not just save a little bit more and just buy from the store, you know, in like with all the packaging, be certain, like having like the, the confidence that this is a, a an authentic piece and I'm getting the in-store experience then I'd buy it as well. Like I'm not going to spend that amount of money on a secondhand bag, especially if I'm like a, a person who's buying this for the first time. If you're a seasoned buyer and you've had that experience many times, then yeah, it doesn't matter, right? Because even during the pandemic when stores were closed, like we were buying things over text, like there was no store experience with that. Things were being shipped to your house. You sometimes didn't even feel like you bought a Chanel handbag because, or anything of luxury because it was just text, okay, you send them your credit card by a link and then it comes to your house. Like you didn't have that experience. So um, in that case, okay, fine. But if you're a first time buyer and the prices are so much higher now that you're already there, you might as well just hold up for a little bit and just buy it from the boutique. That's just, that's just my opinion. Um, and the increases have been even higher now because before there used to be a percentage and still it's a percentage because the amounts were lower when you say applied say 5%, 10%, the increase in dollar amount wasn't as huge but when you're getting to something like seven, eight thousand dollars and then the price increases 10, 15%, that percentage increases a lot translated in dollars. So it just, it's more and more and more every year 
Chanel's getting away with it. So are other brands, okay? Because other brands like uh, Yves Saint Laurent has also increased their prices. Fendi, apparently, I don't know if they did it already, but apparently in the US and here, there was like a 20% increase. So Fendi has apparently done like a huge increase. I don't know if it's live yet, so but it's, it's a lot. And, and actually Fendi it does have some really nice bags. I do really like their peekaboo. Um, I would totally buy it. And I, let me know if you want me to do a video on bags from other brands. I know I focus a lot on Chanel, but that's because I have a lot of it. That's what I buy. Um, but you know, other brands, like I will definitely do a video. I'll try to branch out and talk about other styles. Like we've normalized these prices for these handbags. And that's why other brands are doing it as well. Yes, of course, you know, cost goes up over time, but I mean, the aggressive price increases uh, do work on us. It worked on me. Uh, it makes me want to buy more. Um, and you know, I think with Chanel also, because of that, you know, removing the whole authenticity card and then replacing it with like a replacing the sticker inside with the serial number with like a metal version um, everybody you know speculated that this might be a chip actually it's not um, I, I mean at least that's what I keep being being told that it's not a scannable chip yet when I watch like videos of like let's say a vlog or something like that and um, I'll you know somebody was asking oh so these are scannable and the essay is like yes they are so People are being told different things, but so far I've been told that they're not scannable. And that was something that we kind of felt like, okay, well maybe that's why, you know, we're justifying these price increases because they're adding more, you know, benefits to purchasing these bags, but um, you know, it's, it isn't scannable, unfortunately, at least, at least that's what I've been told. Um, but you know, again, these bags are in glass. Okay. Don't think that they're bad quality. They're not. Uh, like I said, I'm using my bags and I don't have, I don't face any huge quality issues. And if I did, uh, it's always been taken care of as it should be. So they're not glass. They use your bags, enjoy them. Um, don't keep thinking that you're going to resell them because that, then there's no point to you buying the bag. Okay. Buying a piece of luxury is meant to be enjoyed. Uh, so, you know, I mean, even like other women, right? Like when you're a significant other, your husband or your spouse, grabs your bag from the top instead of the handle like sometimes my husband will grab my classic flap from the top and I'm like ah, ah, ah. use the handle and then I'll like freak out that's not okay <laughs> it really isn't okay but he's trained now he'll he'll hold it by the handle and then give me my handbag but it's not okay to think that right like they're not gonna fall apart they're they're well made okay so use them uh, with Hermes uh, you know if they do say, you know, let's say if everybody can start buying these bags, the, the Birkin or the Kelly, the Quota bags, um, for about the same price as Chanel, it's gonna lose its allure because a whole part of the allure of those bags is that it is like sacred. <laughs> and you know, it only, you can't, you can't just go in and buy them, they're special, right? They're rare. And that's why there is a lure to an exclusivity there, right? So if everybody can go and take that chunk of money that they would have spent on Chanel, run over to Hermes down the street and buy a handbag, the desirability is going to go down. People are not going to look at it, those bags, in the same light as they do today. So no, it's not just easy for you to be like, well, I'm just going to buy Hermes, right? It, it doesn't work like that. and. You know, everybody has a different warm and fuzzy feeling when they purchase from a brand. Uh, people feel warm and fuzzy when they buy Dior. Some people feel warm and fuzzy when they buy Louis Vuitton. They feel warm and fuzzy when they feel they buy, you know, Hermes or Chanel. And for me, it's Chanel. I mean, I anything that is part of like anything that is associated with that house, I just love it, and um, I don't think I'll grow sick of it. So, no, I don't think I'll stop buying. Uh, bags from Chanel um, well I mean bags here's the thing right like I already have enough uh, bags I haven't shown you everything obviously uh, but I do have enough <laughs> more than enough and you know there comes a point to how many bags you should have in your collection because you can start to forget about some first of all uh, there are people online who have massive closets of bags uh, even Hermes like Jamie Chua has like a new huge collection. I don't know how she keeps track because mentally, how do you remember what you have and how do you style each bag? 
it's so hard to keep up like you can't like mentally you can't process all those so um, and then also when you have such a sizable collection there will always be handbags that you will prefer using over others and hence those others you will have just sitting there collecting dust and being placed holders in your closet and you just have them there because you can have this number of bags and it can be wasteful but you know if you can afford to do that you do you like I don't I, clearly I won't judge you because I will fully enable anybody to buy as much as they like but um, you know it, it, there comes a point to how much you can process so uh, classic flaps I mean they're very expensive I I still feel like nauseated spending that money on a classic flap now, um, but I love a classic flap. I, I do. I really love enjoying them, and I would love to add a embroidered version in the future. There, and obviously that won't be the standard price for a classic flap because if you go into embroidery, you're going into like high category and clearly I'm not in a position to buy that bag but there was one in Las Vegas that I saw I'll insert a photo um, it was at that time it was like 2017 it was 36,000 US dollars okay so US dollars not Canadian US dollars very expensive but absolutely beautiful I got to touch it I got to try it on like they let me try it on like every year I was there until it finally sold allegedly to somebody of the royal family I would love to have a special edition piece like that, of course, um, but I'm not running to buy more uh, handbags of that sort. Uh, yes, there are some pieces I'd like to add. As you know, I'm still waiting for a black trendy CC. If that comes uh, to light, um, I would love to add another uh, Deauville tote in black. Uh, I would love to have like the Maxi XXL classic flap just for novelty purposes like I would love to have that there's so many things that you can, you just want more and more and more I don't need it I am exploring other parts of the the house I mean I've started off with like my ready to wear <laughs> journey uh, clearly sale pieces only not regular priced but sale pieces uh, but I would I am I'm taking more interest in some of those things uh, you know in hats and gla like I mean I'm like looking at other parts of the house not just handbags so I don't think I'll stop buying uh, definitely I, I still get that warm and fuzzy feeling when I shop there but of course you're gonna be more mindful about what you buy to the people who are frustrated and feel priced out um, I really sympathize with you and I and I think it's very frustrating for anyone trying to buy but like I said if you're gonna buy on the pre-love market don't buy something close to retail price like it has to be a significant discount for you to buy um, if it's close enough that you know you can wait a little bit and just buy from the boutique then buy from the boutique because people on the pre-love market are really taking advantage of this price increase by upping their prices and also um, the fact that there's no authenticity card now I was afraid that people will try to piggyback on that and market bags with authenticity cards as being more desirable or, you know, up being higher price and creating demand in that sense. And I did this video on the authenticity cards, scannable or not scannable, I don't care. I don't care for the authenticity card. Yes, it was nice to have, but it didn't serve me any purpose. And I actually quite like that middle plaque. So don't let anybody think, tell you that, you know, the bags that don't have the cards are not as sought after or are valuable. Because people are still gonna buy them. People are clearly buying classic flops right now without an authenticity card. So I don't think it really changed anything. Um, and, and boutiques have said it was a nuisance because I was talking to one of the managers and she was like, yeah, like people were losing them and you know, yeah, Chanel was saying that they're trying to like cut down on plastic, which, okay, fine, uh, but also cut costs on producing those and keeping track of those cards and you can't, the cards serve no purpose because they can be replicated as well. So, you know, it's, it, it, there's no purpose. So the little plaques that are more reinforced, you know, better, uh, more robust than the little stickers that could peel off, I think that's a better idea. And they switched to that. And like I said before, um, bags in the past, original, like the original bags that started off with the house did not have serial numbers, they didn't have authenticity cards, they didn't have stickers, and it was only introduced for a stretch. And then now they've taken them away and, and, and done something new with the bag. So, you know, it just keep up with the times, it's fine. So. I had my notes on an iPad. Um, I've rambled throughout this video and I hope that's okay. 
that's why I can't read notes like I, I can't because then I'll just be focused on reading uh, I think I've covered everything I've written down <laughs> so if there's anything else I'll meet you guys in the comment section down below or do another video or follow-up video of discussing but I think that's all I wanted to say and yeah these bags they I don't think that they increase in value um, that's the whole marketing that we do in social media that the bags will go up in value uh, that's not true uh, but yes uh, the prices do go up but um, no price is ever you can't put a price on things you can't put value on things value means things means differently to different people and um, yeah it's it is what it is that's what they do that's kind of the reason why Chanel is such a sought after brand because of the price increases and clearly the marketing works on us they're getting away with it right now even post price increase my sales associate two sales associates have actually told me you'd be surprised people are actually coming in asking for classic flaps even after the price increase so clearly it's working <laughs> Okay guys, I will stop rambling now. I think this video is probably long enough. I don't even know how I'm gonna edit it. I think I won't edit it, I don't know, we'll just post it. And let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. I will see you in my next video. Take care, bye.